हेलो 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 अस्सलाम वालेकुम जी आयनु पखेर रागले निहाओ चुने शुमे वश बले ओ हाय गुनजाइमस गुटन मॉर्गन ओला बोंजोर प्रीवियत कैफहाल हाल शमा चतोरे अहलन व सालन मरहबा बूना मूचो ग्रासियास एंड अ वेरी अमेजिंग गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरीबॉडी हु इज ट्यून इनटू पीटीवी वर्ल्ड एंड आर वाचिंग वर्ल्ड दिस मॉर्निंग अलोंगसाइड द वन एंड द ओनली शाहजाद खान आई होप लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन दैट एवरीबॉडी हु इज ट्यून इनटू पीटीवी वर्ल्ड एंड एवरीबॉडी हु इज नॉट are doing perfectly fine in their lives and they're dedicated to achieve whatever they want to achieve in their life but for that obviously you will have to rise and shine wake up get your cups of coffee and make sure that you do justice with whatever you want to achieve in life because i believe that for instance if i go back in time and then there was a time when i was a student and i wanted to be on television it was very hard for me to break it down for me for my own self because i never knew where to go for auditions i never knew how to get my photo shoots done so it's better that if you have a greater goal make smaller goals and then one by one when you start achieving your smaller goals your greater destination will be right in front of you but then there was one thing in life which i realized and that was that for people who are on television it's always a process it's not a destiny so this is this is very in, important and i think this is very imperative in nature that we need to understand that half of the time we think that you know okay we see somebody and we take influence and we take inspiration but half of the time we do not know the type of hard work he's actually put in or she has put in to be at a level where they are so i think that it's always important to have mentors in your life and then follow them till the time you think that you can probably do better than your mentor well don't think like that because usually people do not but other than that ladies and gentlemen once again a very good morning for everybody who's tuned in and in islamabad it's getting colder and colder it's very difficult to get up early in the morning especially for me because i don't know i think i i, I can feel the cold quite a lot too much other uh, other than anybody else because so for the last month i've been traveling all over pakistan so I, i think i'm going to give you a little bit of temperature updates but without figures so when i went to lahore from islamabad it was cold but it was less colder but when i went to karachi daytime was fine but at night you know you could feel it that you know the sea breeze and then the temperature is actually having an impact so if you are planning to travel in the next 24 hours ladies and gentlemen please make sure that you stay dry and you stay warm it's very important i want each and every of my viewer to actually be healthy stay fit and do a little bit of exercise you know it is very important exercise actually takes out all of the stress you have because for example if you are actually lifting 100 kg on your bench press there is nothing else you can think about rather than actually yelling for help oh please somebody can you pick it up but other than that ladies and gentlemen now coming back to what i wanted to discuss today So ladies and gentlemen once again the uh, I'm going to share my own example because uh uh 6 or 7 years ago I was actually I had a problem in my backbone and the problem was very severe it was um uh, it was a disc prolapse and fortunately or unfortunately you know over here we had this uh problem with our mindsets or dilemma that was that you know you shouldn't actually get your backbone operated and people say that you know there are things which can go wrong or you can actually face paralysis in future or it just cannot get better and then the the type of surgery which the doctors over here within pakistan were telling me will take place was actually that they are going to cut me from my backbone for 18 stitches and then they're going to go in drill it and you know the, it was a longer procedure and i was never sure of the results So then somebody told us that you know if you go to England you know there's this uh, keyhole surgery and uh, it's it's it just takes like the surgery actually takes 4 to 5 hours but other than that the best part is that the next day when you wake up you get to go back home and I when I heard about it I was very interested to know who is actually going to do that and then the best part was that there was a Pakistani doctor living in England and he was so innovative in his style and design that he actually designed machines for himself to actually get through to the point where it was minimal invasive so this is uh, something which we have picked up on ladies and gentlemen but we are going to talk in terms of uh, brain because brain i think i believe is a very important organ of human body and unfortunately if something goes wrong 
uh, it can be very dangerous for the family and for people who actually have that person within the family who's actually suffering. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we have been joined by somebody who's actually going to talk uh, about minimal invasive surgery. This gentleman is actually, I think that we really, I'm very proud of the gentleman because he actually went to UK and then to USA and then he decided that I'm going to go back to Pakistan and bring that technology back home. And he's actually, alhamdulillah, successfully done one surgery by now. Well, I don't know the numbers now, but I'll definitely be asking him what is minimal invasive surgery and what happens in it because he says that, you know, if I'm going to operate on you right now, probably you can go back home by six in the evening. And I think that's what people do. But going back home is not what is important. Going back home healthy and fit, I think, is very important. This, these are the few things which we'll be discussing. A lot of people have, uh, go through a lot of different problems. For example, their brain tumors and their other diseases as well, which need to be treated. And people do not treat them because, obviously, you know, when somebody's actually going to put their instruments in your head, you might not even like it. So... Yeah, this, these are the things which we'll be discussing. And since I'm a layman, so I'll probably pose questions to him. He's none other than uh, Dr. Akbar Ali Khan Sahib, who's a consultant neurosurgeon. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Good morning. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam. I'm very good. Thank you very much for joining us. Many thanks for inviting me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And so first things first, I'm going to get started with for a person who was, who was actually in USA or in UK, you know, who got his training in UK and then moved to USA for fellowship and then practiced there for a year and a half because practice over there is very kind of, you know, you can generate a lot of money. Why would you come back to Pakistan? Yeah, so it's a very interesting question. And I think uh, you answered it yourself in your introduction that uh, you were quite scared about your surgery when yeah, you were yeah. getting operated for your back surgery and you had to go outside because you didn't have the, uh, somehow the confidence or the faith in what was going on. Exactly. And essentially, uh, I thought that there is a need for people like me to come back. So you have to go and see a Pakistani surgeon up in England. Yeah. Well, I bring that to you here now. Wow. And uh, essentially, I haven't done one surgery. I've done thousands of surgeries. Uh, and No, uh, we're in, back in Pakistan now. In Pakistan, in, uh, I've started here four months ago, essentially. Okay. And uh, I've started, like, I've started day case surgery. I do day case uh, spinal surgery. So the disc operation that you've done, uh, obviously, there's a stigma attached to it that, oh, uh, I don't want to have it done. I'd rather be in pain or yeah. I'll get it done somewhere outside. Well, no, I've, been st I've started this surgery back in Pakistan as well here right now in Islamabad. Wow. Uh, I operate in the morning and uh, most of my patients have gone home in the afternoon uh, pain-free. Wow. Without any complications. Uh, this is one thing that I do, but on top of that, this is all about minimally invasive neurosurgery. So essentially, uh, essentially like uh, what minimally invasive means is that making a small incision. The smaller incision you make, the smaller time you spend on a patient, uh, the patient is going to recover well and go home. On top of this, uh, obviously I got trained uh, in London, Oxford, and then I was a consultant up in Scotland. Uh, I, train, I did spinal fellowship in Houston, Texas. Wow. Uh, so I trained to like high specifications. And I think people like me should be coming back and bringing all these skills back to Pakistan because that's what we need at present in our country. Yeah, uh, but, but the sole reason that I posed this question to you was of the fact that obviously, you know, you're, you're adding value to a person's life who's actually in pain and mm -hmm. getting him rid of that particular pain is value for that patient. Mm -hmm. But then there needs to be a, a, a payback as well. And I, I don't think that, you know, hospitals over here within Pakistan can actually do justice with the amount of value doctors are adding to the patient's life. Uh, I think we are. Uh, doing justice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would like to change a little bit and add to you. Sure. Uh, I mean, because you mentioned spine. Yeah. It's not the only thing I do. I'm a exactly. neurosurgeon. Uh, there are new things which I have also brought here, uh, include uh, minimal invasive endoscopic neurosurgery. So yeah. what and I do is that. We've got some images as well, so if you feel yeah. like explaining so, them. So, uh, for example, uh, this is a case I'm doing. I mean, essentially, uh, what you have to do is that uh, you make a smaller incision. Yeah. on a patient's head or whenever you're going through a brain uh, the likelihood of complications is less if the incision on the brain itself is small as well and then you can take a tumor out uh, whichever size it is through a very small incision in the brain and you can do that by putting an endoscope so now this is another case i was doing uh, here in islamabad 
uh, which is taking uh, brain tumors out through the nose, so essentially without making any cut. Wow. So I put the camera in, uh, which is an endoscope, uh, and then I take uh, the tumor out. So these things are happening here in Islamabad yeah. right now. Uh, and only um, in Islamabad, I think. No, or not am, only in Islamabad. Or am I assuming? No, 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 not only in Islamabad. Okay. They are uh, happening around here as well. Uh, but uh, I have brought these things uh, essentially to Islamabad. Okay, very nice. Yeah, yeah. So that people, uh, and, and to gain confidence of the people that, okay, if I'm doing minimal invasive neurosurgery, uh, it's your own benefit essentially. One, Okay, okay, I've been trained outside. You have to go outside and get your surgery done. Yeah. You don't have to go outside. Yeah. You can get your surgery done the same way, done here. Exactly. In now, Islamabad. Finally, finally, now we can. Not do finally, it. I mean, it's been four we have got talent in Islamabad as well. We've I mean, got I'm talent not, in I'm Pakistan. Not, I'm not saying or I'm not challenging that we do not have talented doctors over here, but I think that the technology required yeah. for minimal invasive surgery was missing. Because so I, I went through a lot of research while yeah. I was uh, very worried about my back pain. So obviously my hospital has spent a lot of money yeah. uh, on the equipment. Exactly. Uh, some of it has arrived and some of it is on the way, uh, which will be here uh, with us. And that equipment is important. Okay. Uh, because neurosurgery is not a hammer and chisel specialty anymore. Exactly. It has evolved quite a bit. Even it evolved during my training when I was getting trained. Uh, so it's been like almost like 16, 17 years. Yeah. And neurosurgery has evolved to a... To a newer level. A uh, newer level. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and so that's what we are bringing here. Okay, so that's brilliant. So now, now let's let's dig into it. Now, so for, for what kind of problems do people come to you, first of all? And then where do you use your expertise? In which areas? So first of all, we are going to identify the areas wherever minimal invasive surgery can be helpful. And then we'll talk about them separately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, patients who come to me, like for example, pituitary tumors, uh, they're very common. People can come uh, present with... Uh, uh, visual field problems, they can't see properly. Uh, there was a case, uh, the video just went through, I think I operated on him, uh, is one of the illustrative cases that I did here. Uh, and then you can do the case uh, through the nose. You don't even have to make a cut on his uh, head. I took the tumor out through his nose and he went home. Now this surgery is, is, has been around for a while, okay? Yeah. Uh, but the way I do it is slightly different. I do it with an endoscope, which is a different way of doing it. But on top of that, people come with brain tumors. Uh, brain tumors around the brain. So uh, the access to that, you can have neuro navigation, which is kind of a GPS, brain GPS. Okay. So you mark where the tumor is, okay. you make a smaller incision, and then you can put either an endoscope or depending on how you feel, you can take it out without causing any harm to the patient. That is the key. Yeah. So the key is not to harm the patient because whatever I do is neurosurgery. It's serious. Exactly. It uh, is very essentially. serious. Uh, and the idea is to do it uh, minimal invasive. The reason being for that is that less harm to patient, early recovery, you go home sooner. Exactly. And that is what uh, we are doing. At so that's great. Now, uh, I believe that, you know, obviously, you know, when you're operating on a brain, you know, there's definitely certain areas within your own brain where, you know, you cannot have access. Mm -hmm. So are we trying to convince or are we trying to tell or are we trying to prove that with minimal invasive surgery, we can reach at any point within the brain if the GPS is working properly. No, it's not that. I mean, uh, there are certain areas of the brain you still can't operate okay. on. Okay. Uh, uh, it's not that you can't operate. You can operate anywhere. It's just we have to... Uh, there's a Risk analysis, basically. Risk analysis yeah. or the idea of a neurosurgeon standard uh, in training, which is ingrained in you, is that do no harm. Okay. Uh, so if you think you're going to operate on a place and you're going to cause more harm, yeah. then it's not worth doing it. Okay. So, 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 ladies and gentlemen, if you're out there, I think till now we've established that, first of all, people who, who actually live within Islamabad, you know, and people like me who actually have to travel abroad to actually get their uh, uh, surgeries done. Now, finally, we've actually uh, been joined by Dr. Akbar Ali Khan Sahib over in Islamabad for the last four months, and he's doing minimal invasive surgery. So, for people who've actually got a tumor and they're still thinking what to do. And I think that, you know, people who actually get brain tumors have to use a lot of steroids at times to actually shrink the size of the tumor too. And uh, uh, so now, finally, I don't think that, you know, you actually need to use steroids. I think steroids. he knows a lot of medicine <laughs> for being a <laughs> television you know, presenter. Yeah, <laughs> obviously, because, because, I've, because I've seen cases and I think that, you know, this is, this is my job, so I have to put in a lot of I research. Know, I know, I know. But I think that it's a great job and it's a great re relief for people from, uh, you know, probably not just in Islamabad, because people travel from 
far flung areas to islam but to have a greater facility yeah, of the people medication. have been seeing patients from uh, halfway across and Pakistan. you were telling me a case of uh, from up north somewhere as well yeah so cases come from up north and up so uh, down south all the way uh, but there are people are still not aware that uh, actually this minimal invasive is now available in islamabad you don't yeah. have to travel that far uh, South Pakistan or anywhere, and you can get it done here. So, if you don't mind me asking, would you mind sharing the finances involved for somebody who's actually watching right now? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, so that we could actually give him a generic idea of that. Yeah. You know, if you've got yes, yeah, so the good thing is uh, when you develop a brain tumor uh, or a severe spinal problem, uh, you don't think about money because essentially it's either you're going to die or you're going to get paralyzed. Yeah. These are serious issues that exactly. you're dealing with. So whenever a patient comes to me, this is a new thing. Obviously, I've come to Pakistan, so people tend to ask about money. I do tell them that this is a serious thing. Yeah. So life is much more worth Don't than about any money. money. Uh, but uh, in reality, I do see my hospital provides uh, care to private uh, yeah. patients. And at the same time, I see patients who can't afford anything. So falahi, we call them. Yeah. And I see falahi patients as well. And I do surgery for free. Wow. So it's all available for you. So how whether long Whether you can it afford take? it or whether you can't afford yeah. it, you, we will still provide care to you. Wow, very nice. So how long does it take for any doctor while operating with the minimal invasive surgery technique to probably remove a tumor? And you know, since you mentioned that you've been taking the tumors out of the nose too as well, but tumors can be bigger in size. Yes. So how do you do it then? Uh, so uh, essentially it's a lot of training. Uh, and skill involved. Yeah, obviously. And for that, you have to train for many, many years. It's yeah. not just a steady hands. Three, four. You need steady hands, very steady hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you need a good training. Uh, so somebody who has trained you very well in the art. So, for example, I was trained by somebody uh, who had done over four thousand of these operations, uh, and uh, is probably the world-renowned surgeon in that regard. Uh, so he trained me. Uh, so then you suddenly like kind of imbibe or absorb stuff from him and yeah. then you can go and get ahead and do it. Tumors can be very, very big, but uh, trust me, I've, review, uh, I've removed uh, like uh, the size of a, uh, probably bigger than a tennis ball through the nose. Really? Yes. Through the nose. So what do you do? You cut it and then suck it out, right? Yeah. So I think there was an illustration on going uh, just a while ago. I mean, it's just an illustration uh, and there's a case I'm doing on the side as well. Uh, yeah. Not this one. There is another one. So there's another case. Uh, there's another case uh, with a video on. where I'm doing it. This one, I'm doing it through the nose. So essentially, you can see the view is quite different when you're doing it by an endoscope. This yeah. is I'm drilling through the base of the skull. Uh, probably it's too graphic for the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for people watching it early <laughs> you can in the see morning. It, I'm it on the television. So it's a very delicate surgery. So this is one of the ways of doing it. So there are many surgeries you can do, uh, and you can suck out the tumor or various things that you use. Uh, but at the same time, you can do it through the brain as well. Small cut. You go in, take the tumor out on the spine. Uh, time. People do ask. Actually, I've noticed that since I've come to Pakistan. How long is the operation going to take? Yeah. And my answer to them is very simple. Does it matter to you how long the operation takes or how you will be after the operation? Yeah. And then they start thinking about it because the general concept is if an operation takes two hours, oh, I might not be okay. It's a very big surgery. Yeah. But essentially, a, a disc operation, a disc operation, lumbar disc surgery that you had done can take like 30 to 45 minutes. Yeah. Essentially, but that doesn't mean it's a simple operation. No, but, <laughs> but I still, uh, I still got to know that you know my operation was four hours long. No, that's not how it is. I'll explain to you. You know, two hours is a very short period. Yeah. People over, for example, you know, uh, when minimal invasive surgery wasn't over here, yeah. people had actually been in the theaters for a longer period of time. That was the reason because now we're com having a comparison of yeah. the. Older trends of the surgery and then the newer yeah. trends as well. So what are yeah. the benefits we so, want to reap? Yes, that's what I'm trying to uh, add to you as yeah. well uh, uh, and to the public as well. That time, okay, you spent four hours, but you came out well. Yeah, didn't very you? well. Does it matter to you? Spend oh, it four doesn't hours? matter to me. Yeah. yeah. So for anybody who asks me this, I say, I never give them a ball power. I can do this operation in two minutes. Whoever says that to you, I think is just <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to have it done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's time is not important. Yeah. So I give them a reassurance that this is the risk of surgery and this would be your outcome and this is the expected outcome. I myself have done like I can present the results of my own surgeries which yeah. I've done well over a hundred of these, uh, especially endoscopic pituitary surgeries, that this would be 90% cure rate I can give you. You like it or not, it's up to you. Okay, so let's, let's, talk, uh, let's talk about the risks involved within doing this procedure. 
So now you, since you mentioned that, you know, whenever a patient comes in, you're mm -hmm. going to let him know or her mm -hmm. know about the risk involved. And then obviously with the time thing, you're mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm not going to say that it's two minutes or two hours. Mm -hmm. But what matters is that you need to come out fine. Mm -hmm. So how, how longer it is doesn't really matter. And I think the patient needs mm -hmm. to understand that. So what are the yeah. challenges? So uh, as we are on the theme of minimal invasive neurosurgery, yeah. the risks are the same as <coughs> open surgery. Okay. okay? Uh, there is no difference between minimal invasive or uh, open surgery when the risks come into play. Yeah. And the uh, serious surgery that we do, obviously, they, it does carry a risk to life. Uh, but when people come to us, they're in a situation that if we don't operate, yeah. uh, they're not going to make it, so then, some of them. Yeah. So essentially that risk kind of outweighs itself, again, in favor of benefit uh, towards <laughs> surgery. But uh, with minimal invasive, the only thing that I add to them is that you're going to go home soon, yeah. you're going to feel better soon, and you'll most likely be having lunch or tea in Munal later on in the evening. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, it's great that you, that you uh, talked about having dinner or lunch probably, but, you know, they, they've never sponsored our show, so it's perfectly <laughs> all right not to mention their name. No, no. Oh, oh yeah. No, <laughs> it's all right. No, no. It's a it's nice right. place to go. Yeah, yeah. It is a nice place to be. Yeah. But other than that, now moving on with uh, minimal invasive surgery, what, what, what is the type of equipment you use? Obviously, you said it is endoscopic. Yeah. But then why do you think that we took so long to actually bring in that technology and you're still mentioning that your hospital is invested yeah. and the equipment is still yet to be in Pakistan, so. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> yeah, essentially every time um, a change, you try and bring a change, uh, there is uh, always resistance and there is always, that's a yeah, standard challenges, thing. Yeah, challenges, yeah, yeah. Uh, challenges and uh, convincing people that we are bringing this new technology. So every time this happens, this is yeah. a standard thing. Uh, it takes time. Yeah. So I don't think I need to explain myself in this why it took time. Change does take time. So yeah, okay. You know, because is, uh, I think I think you've answered it beautifully, and this is the reason why I asked it because I know for sure that you know even within doctors there is competition. Yeah, so yeah. and you know it's it's not the people who actually do not want to change or want to move on towards better health equipment or health facilities, but why do you think the doctors have this thing that, okay, you know, the new thing is coming, my clinic's probably okay, going to I'll go I'll tell shut you down. one thing, okay. Yeah. Uh, in my department, I'm sorry for doing this no, to no, you. No, 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 in my department, there is no competition. Okay. Uh, I actually compliment the department that I'm working in. I've got a very good team, okay. Uh, there are four of us. Uh, and essentially what I'm adding is a new angle to the whole thing. And essentially we are just trying to build a... Uh, team that is moving forward as a Great. one thing, okay? Great. Essentially, I brought new skills to already the skills and talent that is there. So, essentially, I think uh, it's competition, what you say, is different. Yeah. Uh, this is not a competition. This is just providing better care to patient, patient safety. Very nice, I like and it. And try and work together. I definitely like it. But now I'm going to go back to one of the phenomena which I faced when I was looking for a doctor. And that is that whenever I would take my MRIs with me and mm. go to a doctor, or in fact, a surgeon, you know, without even taking a look at my MRIs, they'll probably recommend me a surgery. And this was one thing which I never liked over here in Pakistan. And it's because of the fact that when I went to UK and I uh, obviously had my MRIs and each and every report with me, so, and I told him that, you know, every doctor has actually recommended a surgery for me. And they were fine too, uh, you know, they because they said it, that you need surgery and by, at the end, you know, I had to get a surgery done. But I was very, you know, uh, I, I didn't like the sentiment of, you know, going and seeing a surgeon, not a physician, and he or she just recommended you that, you know, and you're going to be fine because I've, I've heard those lies. Mm -hmm right on my face, 18 stitches in your mm -hmm. backbone, mm -hmm. and you never know whether you're going to get fine or not. Mm -hmm. So why do you think surgeons have this uh, tendency to make sure that, you know, that the person is actually going to come back to them, whether the surgery is needed or not, but I think the doctors have done it. Well, the reality is... Uh, this um, is the reality. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I've been seeing that since I've started practice in Pakistan. I'm gradually seeing all this that's happening. Uh, but mashallah, I've done a certain number of surgeries within a very short time. No, I'm not of talking time. about you, but I'm but talking reason, about this concept. The reason, the reason is that uh, because I was, you have to spend time yeah. with your patient. 
telling them, taking them through everything, that this is going to be your journey. It's like yeah. a journey, it's not just one step. Exactly. And then coming to the point of a scan and then operating and then taking it from there. Yeah. So it's uh, uh, convincing a patient is a slow process. <laughs> Uh, they and do get the reality it. is, uh, from my point of view, if anybody is not sure, I send them home and say, why don't you think about it? Yeah. Like spinal surgery, for example, it's a non-urgent operation. Yeah. You think about it, come back in a month, if your pain is still the same, then we can think about doing surgery. Exactly, but the pain reaches a certain level where the patient really wants to get the surgery done, but one way or the other, you know, the doctor is not very convincing. And I think that's a problem over here with, uh -huh. with the people who actually want to get the surgeries done. Because mm -hmm. over here in Pakistan, we have this concept, brain and backbone. No way, nobody's getting mm -hmm. a chance to open this up. I think this will take time, you know. Uh, uh, ethics and everything uh, which uh, involve in this medical practice. Uh, I'll give you a very brief example. Sure. So I was going on the road and I was trying to ask away uh, for a, my cousin's place who lives yeah. somewhere up uh, mean Bahri, uh, it Bani uh, so uh, I lowered the window and the moment I tried to ask a question he actually went like this <laughs> I said, what? Uh, and then I said I'm just ask, going to ask you <laughs> yeah. so the general tendency of people is that uh, if I don't know gonna, what's going to happen uh, yeah. yeah what's going to happen yeah, 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 uh, yeah this surgeon is going to do this but in reality the way I've been trained is that I, I'm going to provide you service uh, whatever is best for you yeah if you want to have it have it if you don't want to have it don't have it doesn't bother me Exactly. But thank you very much. It was great to have you on, on the show. I know that the time limit was very short. It's but okay. other than that, uh, it is very imperative for the medicine over here within Pakistan. And my Pakistani doctors, ladies and gentlemen, one way or the other, are very famous all over the globe because of the, because of the techniques they have and because of the type of faith they have uh, on their Allah before they do the surgery too as well and I think people have done great. Thank you very much for bringing this technology to Pakistan. But one last thing that is, are you even training other people over here in Pakistan for minimal invasive surgery? Yes, so this is something, uh, obviously it's got a very uh, steep learning curve, okay. So um, my idea is to establish uh, yeah. uh, this whole center where I'm working as a minimal invasive neurosurgical uh, service wow. uh, and then in due course we'll train people we have got trainees and the idea is to train them so that they don't have to go anywhere else to get trained but wow. this will take time okay this will take time and and you know since you mentioned that uh, while you were doing your training the the medical technology was evolving so while you're practicing it's evolving as well right so do you, are you guys working on that too as well yeah, so what I do is that I still stay up to date. This is something which I'm te uh, teaching my trainees now as well, that you don't have to read a book which was written 20 years ago yeah. and you're still reading the same and going for the same exam. Yeah. Uh, read journals, go to international conferences. You have to uh, come on par with whatever is happening in the exactly. West. And for that, you have to be in touch with everything. Exactly. And if you're not, you didn't like behind. So thank you very much, Dr. Akbar, for being with us. It was lovely to have you. And for people who are out there, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, once you get the surgery done, I am telling you 100% sure, I'm not telling you that you actually need to get the surgery done, but if you think that, you know, the pain is unbearable now, or probably, you know, the conditions are going to be life-threatening, I think that you probably get your surgery done, be perfect once again, I am, and now I go to the gym, I exercise, a workout, because when you're going to stay healthy, you can roam around the world. This is one thing which we'll be talking about in our next segment, don't go anywhere, we will be right back. Good morning.
All right, people, welcome back. For everybody who just got tuned into PTV World, you're watching World this morning alongside Shazad Khan. Ladies and gentlemen, earlier we were in conversation with Dr. Akbar, who was an expert in minimal invasive surgery. But before going towards the break, I told you that to roam around the world, you obviously have to be very healthy, especially if you're going to roam around the world on your bicycle. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been joined by some superb guests from uh, two different uh, places. But now, finally, they are married and they got married while they, when they started traveling on their bicycles as well. We're going to ask them about their journey. What are they doing in Pakistan? How did they reach here? All of these questions. Hold on for a second. On my right hand side from Slovenia, ladies and gentlemen, we have been joined by Katia. Hello. Hi, how are you? Hello, I'm very good. Thank you. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for joining us. And from Czech Republic, ladies and gentlemen, we have been joined by Miroslav, hello, how are you? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Ek, do, teen, char, paanch. How are you? Tika, <laughs> tika. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you over here in Pakistan. And like any other Pakistani, we welcome you. And Thank you. the most warm welcome, I think, yes. is this one probably. I don't I want it so. to be any other. But let's start uh, with the conversation because we're left with only 15 minutes okay. and we to fill in our... Uh, viewers with whatever information you have to share so shoot when did you start bicycling and then when did you start traveling by by bicycle by bicycle we started in 2002 okay and we started in thailand and since then actually i didn't know if i'll be able to do it but since then i can't stop <laughs> <laughs> very nice what about you yeah it's very addictive we start on the bicycle at the same time we got the idea in morocco actually because we met two cyclists from England and uh, they come to Morocco all the way Don't from worry. England so and then we see it's very possible and most importantly it's environmental mm. and this is what we were searching for some yeah. environmental way to live. Yeah, this is what I, I wanted to ask. Why would you do that? Because this is a lot of exercise, this is a lot of, it needs a lot of strength, it needs a lot of energy. People fly by planes to go to different places and stay in hotels and whatnot. So why are you leaving behind all of that comfort? I think it's like because you are slow enough, but not too slow. Yeah. You don't need to carry anything on your back. Everything is on a bicycle and yeah. you can meet the, the people and places in between the places. Yeah, yeah, people yeah, go yeah. from A to B, but you can see everything. So in it's between. like in detail. Yes. You know, for example, if, uh, if I'm going to travel from Islamabad to up north, probably I'll take an aeroplane. But, you know, the cities in between, I'll miss You'll out on miss, them. Yeah. So now we have got pictures. Please do share with us where were they taken. Well, they're obviously in so Pakistan. This one, no, the actually, they are all... Are, so this one is in Myanmar. Yeah. We were cycling. The one before was in Himalayas. This is China. China or Kazakhstan, maybe. This is also Myanmar. Okay. We were just we we were so happy we just Myanmar, come from a shortcut. <laughs> we actually uh, we are joined me. by other four cyclists. Uh, so when Myanmar. I can't, so this is a road India. in Spiti Valley, just on the other side of the border. Okay. And for, and how many countries have you been? We don't really know. We don't. Um, you don't even know. No, we don't well, count. About sixty countries. On a bicycle, no. No, like all together. About all together, yeah. but on the bicycle, maybe it's bicycle been 30, more than, I don't between know. thirty and forty countries. Yeah. Between thirty and forty. We don't so, know. So, yeah. so, so when did you come to Pakistan? We come in June, five I think. Ago. Five months ago. And more where, than five months ago. And which route did you take to come to Pakistan? Where have you been in Pakistan? We came through Vaga border, through okay, India. Okay, from Lahore? Uh, from Lahore, and then we come to Islamabad, and then slowly... On your bicycles? All on our bicycles. Yes. And then we went from Islamabad slowly to Haripur, Abbottabad. Yes. And then we took Kaganaran. Kaganaran? And the Babusar top. <laughs> so, so you, know, you know, this is what I wanted to ask, because for me, I cannot even ride a bicycle or, you know, probably do that thing in the gym for more than five minutes. I get bored. <laughs> and I think I probably get bored because I still get to see the same surrounding. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and I've already done it for five kilometers. So, you know, going to Babusir Top, it's, it's such a hard job on your bicycles job. with all of that luggage. How did you do that? We do but it very slowly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but this is, uh, you know, about the goals you set in your life, mm -hmm. you know. If, if your goals are to try to have, uh, to, to uh, leave as less, uh, a smaller footprint behind you, you yeah. know, ecological, environmental, yeah. and uh, to stay healthy, then, um, and you want to see the world. Then and the bicycle is really the best uh, option. Exactly. And you are happy when you achieve, you know, like sometimes there are things like Babu Sartop. I was like, oh, I don't know, can we do it? I knew we can because we did in India higher passes. Yeah. But when you reach 
this goal you set, you're so happy because you did it by yourself. <laughs> yeah, but the weather conditions are getting tougher day by day now. Yes. So, you know, and going to Babu Sitop in such conditions you is... You get it all. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's like very difficult, you know, and, uh, and it's very challenging and it can actually take your life too as well if you realize that, if you got for a bit slip, if there's, you know... Any yeah, you have to be careful, yeah. but yeah. this can happen, but you know, like you don't need, you can just slip on a road and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you can say the whole life is gamble. Yes. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, you important. can reduce the, the risks, you know, like when you go with a bus or other driver, then yeah. you put your life in his hands, <laughs> yes. you know. Like. Yeah. <laughs> so at least you have your will in yeah. your hands. Exactly. <laughs> and then how many times does that happen? Because you, 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 you guys are married as well, right? Mm. So how many times does that happen that you want to stop and he's like, okay, you know, we still have to keep on pushing. Well, he wants actually, to. He our, just go. We keep our own <laughs> speed, you know. She oh. like it slow, I like it fast. So... I go my speed uh, because Hello. I also carry a lot of weight on the yeah. bicycle, so you have to go your speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do not you have get to maintain too tired. your momentum. And yeah. I have to just reach him. <laughs> so <laughs> so I like reading books. Yeah. So I go and then stop, wait, read book till she come. And <laughs> Sometimes and, and, she's like, why did you come? <laughs> <laughs> and then how do, you, how do you communicate in between as well when if, if, if somebody's left behind? Mental. Oh, mental. mental. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, this is what I wanted to talk about. Because ladies and gentlemen, when I got their profiles, I got to know that for the last 25 years, they have been vegan and they haven't had any, uh, you know, uh, probably meat or dairy diet as well. Both. Yeah. Mm. Well, what is the reason behind that? And when did you start to do that? Environmental and health issues. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so that's your prime focus. Yeah. 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 But then half of the time, you know, there might be things that you, know, need, you, you probably, your body might be in need of higher protein intake. Yeah. What do you do then? We yeah. get a lot of protein. Like uh, you know, when people are, they are like, "Oh my God, how can you eat? I don't know vegetables and do this." And we're like, "We're pr yeah. very healthy, and yeah. maybe people who eat meat will be harder for them to do this." <laughs> like I used to be very sick when I was eating meat. You know, oh. I grew up on meat, and 20 years of my life I was on. Uh, a carnivorous diet, yeah. <laughs> but uh, when I stop eating meat, I start being healthier. Mm. You know, also you my bones energy. were getting better because uh, I used to break my bones a lot. Uh, I, in my country, everyone believes you have to drink milk and eat dairy products to keep st your bones yeah. strong. But so uh, <laughs> it didn't work for me. So, why, yeah. so when you're traveling, isn't it a challenge to cook food even? Cook food, no, but to eat outside Pakistan is a big challenge. Really? Yeah, because it's a very meat-eating country. So um, from Lahore to Islamabad, you know, you are cycling so on a road, so you, st you, you don't have a motorbike or a car, yeah. so you can't just go another five kilometers. Yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to stop when you're exactly. tired. So a few times happened that we would stop in a daba and they would only have even simple vegetable and dal, they have meat, so we would have chapati and banana. <laughs> oh <my laughs> but God. in the north was easy. There is not north. much choice for vegans yeah. in the restaurants yeah. in Pakistan. So, you know, you try it um, there and there, and then you try it all, actually. And then uh, we cook, and we know our food is the best, yeah. because also, I know Pakistani food is supposed to be very tasty. We eat at home very, very good food. Yeah. But for us, it's very oily, especially in yes. the south. Yes. We enjoy the food in and the And it's more north. spicy over here, too, as well. Yeah, we don't mind spicy. So, so, so yeah, obviously, <laughs> since you haven't tried, uh, you know, vegetables from any of the restaurants, I cannot probably ask you the best dish you have actually had. I, I, I love lobia. Lobia, okay, <laughs> yes. that's oh. great. And the we beans. love alu palak. Alu palak, <laughs> alu palak <spread. laughs> yes. Oh, wow, that's great. And I think uh, it's, it's a healthy choice. I it like lobia and alu palak <laughs> as well. And they... Still and remember the name. And here it gives you a lot of <laughs> exactly. also protein. Exactly, but half of the time when you're traveling, you know, you might not even get a dhaba to, or, or yes. to, you know, it's difficult to find a place to eat. What do you guys do then? We, we carry a lot of provisions food, with yeah, us. We have because okay. we also like to go to very remote areas, yeah. you know, in the mountains, to be out of the city as much as possible. So yeah. sometimes it's few so. days when there is nothing. So we can be free. This is the freedom that you have. Yeah. And what kind of cooking do you do? Because, you know, I've, I've One been... One pot cooking. Yeah, <laughs> because... because for me, I've been to a lot of places outside Pakistan and I've seen that, you know, half of the time people do eat raw vegetables as well oh, or, yeah. the, or then the half cooked yeah. and then no spices, no oil, no nothing, yeah. just steam it and just eat it. We do That's actually Broccoli, avocados and yeah, whatnot. We do That's different. what I love. I yeah. prefer uh, raw vegetables. Yeah, yeah wow. so we do a lot like when there, when there is a 
you know, obviously in the mountains where it's desert, there is not much to choose. So when we have a choice and chance, we have a lot of salad, yeah. so raw vegetables. And then mostly when we eat, we eat breakfast and dinner when we cycle. So it would be like one pot. And Actually, what about fruits? Fruits. We love oh, fruits. Yeah. Okay. Actually, there is All many <laughs> people who are only on a raw veg diet. Yeah. 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 And uh, some of them are uh, professional athletes. Because yeah. it's the healthiest. So, yeah. But at the same time, you know, Pakistan is an agriculture-based economy and we do have a lot of agriculture fields mm. and, you know, we grow a lot of fruits. So have you tried fruits over here in Pakistan? Oh, yeah. Uh, Which fruit do you love the most? Hunza, <laughs> the best apples like, and apricots um, and yeah. walnuts. Uh, pomegranate. Pomegranate, yeah. yeah you have the best favorite. mangoes also. Mangoes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, we were here in the season. <laughs> they were very good. Yeah, I think that's great. But I, you guys got married in 1998, right? No, in 2000. In 2000, yeah. okay. You guys got married in 2000. Um, I'm, I'm very sorry, I don't know whether I should ask you or not, but do you guys have kids? No. No, no. So, so you do not have that responsibility right no, now. No, we choose yeah. that this so, life we should just... So this is it? <laughs> like, so you just want to travel. Yeah. So what are your future plans then with your We bicycle? don't know. To see as much of yeah. the world as possible. And meet as much <laughs> and people. hopefully to go on other planet as well. <laughs> oh, wow, that's great. Well, but not, not on a bicycle, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> or probably a flying bicycle. You know, with the uh, in new inventions, how the technology... Yeah, you never know. <laughs> no, but flying but cars. You know. But you know, because we've got more than 190 countries on this globe and you've been to 60, now which other countries would you love to travel? And which, ha which countries have you traveled already? Each country is special. Special, yeah. We travel, so mostly we spend time in Asia. Uh, and then we travel from Europe all the way back to Through Asia. Central Asia, Middle okay. East. Um, yeah, so we did quite a lot of countries. We love Asia. We have been here since 2002. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. when Asia will let us go, then we would like to go to America and see America. There is Africa. You know, the world Cycle is from big. Alaska down yeah. to yeah. South America. Okay, yeah. that's great. But then, you know, half of the time, whenever I'm, I have to plan a vacation, I actually have to plan uh, for a year because of the fact that I have to work throughout the year mm. and then take out 20 days or 21 days mm. to spend all of that money which I've saved throughout <laughs> the year. Mm. Yes. So for people who have been traveling for the last 18 years or more, mm. how do you generate that income yeah. to travel and then spend? We carry our workshop with us. Yeah. Oh, you carry your workshop, so yeah. you, wherever you're going, you're working. Yeah, we are not artists. everywhere, yeah. but, but yeah. one way or the other, it can be illegal in other countries yes, because yes. you do no. not have a work <laughs> permit. Course. Yeah, well, no, no, we are modern no much. So no, no much. We use internet, so okay. Yeah, and sometimes we do like um, street performance as well okay. with the yeah. fire, like this. Fire, really, fire yes. juggling. <laughs> so, and uh, you never brought anything to juggle with uh, you today. With no. the fire here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, no. we could without fire, but. No, we Sorry. didn't. Next time. But, <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you've realized it or not, but they've got some very spe special hairstyles. And I believe that their hair are very long as well. So yes, long. would you mind sharing it? Can, can you open this up too yeah. so that we can <laughs> actually show it to people out there as well? It's very... Oh my God. For how long have you haven't been to a barber? Uh, since, since 1990. Since 1990, you haven't been to a barber. What about you? <laughs> well, I was in like primary school. I always wanted to have long hair, okay. and my mom, because I didn't like to comb, yeah. my mom she cut it very short, and I said I'll never cut it again, and I didn't. <laughs> so, would you mind show, yes. showing showing it to us? So that my actually hair very is useful. Very do you long. do you guys like compete? Okay, mine no, is longer. No, we do Because you know, like everybody have different yeah. size, yeah. so. I, we have a friend for 10 years, it grew till here and it's still here. Okay. So it's just... Okay, very nice. So when you guys met, uh, both of you had long hair? Yeah. Yes, yeah. not so long, well, obviously. <laughs> but uh, the same hairstyle. Yeah. yeah, so towards the end, I just wanted to ask you, you know, how did you guys meet and then how did you guys got married? Because you both were traveling when you got married, right? Yeah, so we met in Israel. Okay. And we met again after, very like by chance, in Egypt again after half a year. Okay. And then we met again in Europe. Wow. And then yeah, we, we gave decide, it some time. Yeah. yeah. And then we decide to travel. So we travel with a little car for one year in Europe. Yeah. And this is then also when we married and we decide, well, he decided we will be cycling. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think it was uh, India and this region which uh, uh, like brought us together. Because mm. when oh we yeah. met, we were both on our way back, back to, to India. This area, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I wish you best of luck for thank your future you. endeavors. Yeah. It was wonderful to have you over here. And I would thank love to you. thank this gentleman over here in the studio who actually bring these people to us too as well. And we would love to welcome you uh, over and over again and again. We and we want again. you to please continue <laughs>
so that you you continue with your mission where you are actually trying to tell people that lesser damage, lesser footprint yeah. will important. actually be helpful yeah. for the future generations yes. as well. Where you're not even thinking about having your own future generation, but it's perfectly all right. <laughs> yeah, not because in the world we are now, I would not yeah. want to. Have Thank you very much for being with us, <laughs> Katya and Miroslav. Thank you very much. And for people who are out there, ladies and gentlemen, it definitely takes a lot of dedication and a lot of hard work to do what you want to do or what you want to achieve. This is what I started with my show with, and this is what I'm going to close it up with as well. Please do not forget to write to us on our Facebook page, which is with the name of World This Morning. On Twitter, it's World This Morning without a G. On Daily Motion and YouTube, it's World This Morning. And this fabulous repeat is going to be at 5 past 11 p.m. tonight. Till the next time, one, two, three. Good morning. <laughs>